Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our pinnacle, though not final event, wrapping up a season of virtually connecting with you all since COVID came to town. Since we're unable to have him in person, John has prepared what is sure to be a memorable and inspiring keynote address delivered to us in what is oddly becoming a far too familiar environment here on Zoom. So please join me in welcoming folk music renaissance man, master instrumentalist, powerful songwriter, storyteller, activist, and author, John McCutcheon. Hi folks. Welcome to the 2020 Farm Conference and the virtual keynote address. I have to say, um, even though my music and my uh, career has been uh, indelibly linked with the South, I'm actually a native Midwesterner born in North Central Wisconsin. And I can't tell you how proud and honored I am to be here with you in this capacity. I have been told in no uncertain terms that some music is expected, so I thought I would uh, begin with an ode to a late, great Midwesterner. In these times, each day feels like the next. But just tonight, my old friend Richard sent a tearful text. Feel his sorrow on the screen, wondering if I heard the news tonight. John Prime died. Oh, he seemed to pluck his songs out of thin air. They told a tiny triumph. And lives filled with despair Complex in their simplicity So honest and so true Just like every writer Wished that they could do There's an angel from Montgomery He's finally taken wing In a place up there called Paradise Where even Sam Stone sings all the losers, lovers, loners gather round the throne in a mighty choir to welcome John Prime home. I remember a night in a bar in Cambridge Town. The band took a break. We took the stage and shut the whole place down. It was Stevie Goodman's birthday, just eight years since he died. Oh, we sang, drank, and remembered. We laughed and then we cried, just like tonight when I heard John Prine die. There's an angel from Montgomery, it's finally taken wing. Place up there called paradise where even Sam Stone sings. All the losers, lovers, loners have gathered round the throne in a mighty choir to welcome John Prime home. Tonight I'm sitting here thinking about the stories that we tell. And the blessed few who really do make heaven out of hell. So say hello to Stevie, I ain't ready for you yet. And in the meantime, I know you'll enjoy that nine miles cigarette. There's an angel from Montgomery who's finally taken wings. Place up there called paradise where even Sam Stone sings. All the losers, lovers, loners gather round the throne in a mighty choir to welcome John Prime home. Losers, lovers, loners have gathered round the throne in a 
mighty choir to welcome John Prine home. Well, being as this is a gathering of folk music enthusiasts, I thought I would begin, as you do, with a football story. I want to take you all back to the NFL 21, uh, 2011-2012 season. Now, as many of you know, uh, also because I just said it, I'm originally from northern Wisconsin, lived the first 18 years of my life there. And as my grandfather used to say, if you are from Wisconsin and you have a pulse and a penis, you are a Packers fan. And I always have been, am now, and always will be a fan of the Green Bay Packers, the only publicly owned sports franchise in all of sports. I mean, one of the things you will probably never hear is, yeah, I used to be a Packers fan. So it was particularly thrilling for an old Packers fan like myself after the Packers had won the Super Bowl in 2011 to have our quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, awarded the Most Valuable Player Award for his play the following season as well. And I remember uh, going by the gym uh, the day after this happened and all my buddies there know me. And they said, well, Mr. Green Bay Packer fan, I guess you must be pretty excited that your boy won the MVP for the NFL. And I said, well, I am, and I think it's a great honor, but I'll be honest with you, I, I think someone else deserved it more. And they said, well, who could that be? And I said, Peyton Manning. And they said, Peyton Manning of the Indianapolis Colts? Hell, he didn't play last year. He had that season-ending neck injury. And I said, and how did the Colts do? And they thought, and they said, well, they were 2-14. and 14. And I said, okay, what greater proof is there of the value of something or someone than the demise of everything around it when it ain't there? Or to quote... Joni Mitchell, who I would suspect has never been quoted in the middle of a football story, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Which brings us to today. Don't it always seem to go? To, to go? I mean, we have all missed so much this year. And we're trying to do things to be an, an adequate substitute. I mean, hell, how bad do we all have it that we are here doing this? We have certainly, as someone who makes their living from this trade, as many of you all do out there, whether you be performers or agents or you writers or you work for a record company or whomever, uh, Y'all know that no one survives in this trade, in this little tiny sliver of the music business, without being flexible and resilient and creative. And boy, this year has, has taxed our creativity. I mean, we musicians have had to learn how to be uh, simultaneously uh, videographers and sound engineers and, oh yeah, do a show staring into a camera lens in, instead of the eyes and the faces of hundreds of people who have chosen to spend the evening with us. And those of us who love live music have learned to watch it by ourselves on a screen. And we miss that intimacy of, of being in a, a little dark room with uh, shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of strangers and surrendering ourselves to the night, to the music, to this experience in the hopes of on the best of those nights creating a kind of community that we hope and want to carry into the rest of our lives 
and into the world in general. So we miss that magic when it happens. And those of us who, who travel from one of your all cities to the other, imagine ourselves to be the common thread. But really, I believe the true connective tissue is the music itself. And I think what I want to do in this next little while is examine that and the ways in which we do this very well and the ways that we have strayed from the true purpose of why we all got here in the first place. And so I want to start off talking about just a few minutes about how and why I got here in the first place. It started in 1963. Uh, I was 11 years old, and the most important thing in my life was Little League Baseball. And lo and behold, in 1963, I had achieved my life's dream. I was the starting catcher on my town's Little League All-Star team. Now, we lived out in the country, and uh, those of you who grew up in rural parts of, of the Midwest know that every 11-year-old knows how to drive. Every 11-year-old knows how to drive a tractor. Every 11-year-old knows how to drive a pickup truck and has when they were too little to hoist the bales during haying season. But not too many of us are driving ourselves across town to Little League practice in the old Massey Ferguson. No, for that, I needed my mom and I was searching in vain for her in our little house. And I was getting frantic because I knew I was going to be late. I finally found her in the last place I thought she would be doing the last thing I thought she would be doing. She was in our family room watching television. On a Tuesday afternoon, this was so unlike her that it stopped me in my tracks. Now, I had worked myself up into what my grandfather called, my grandmother called a state of high fuss. And I put on my best imitation of 11 year old hissy fizzy, come on, mom, we gotta go. And without ever taking her eyes off that little 12 inch zenith, she just patted the couch next to her. She said, sit down here, watch this with me. Now, in our house, television was a controlled substance. And my mother had never before, and it turns out never did again, invite me to watch television with her. So I was curious. I was curious about what was on television, and I was curious about her. What had so enraptured her? And as I took my place beside her on that tired little sofa, I beheld in front of me the March on Washington, the I Have a Dream speech, March on Washington, the very first thing in our nation's history that was ever broadcast live on all three channels. Yes, you young people out there heard me correctly, all three channels. And it was remarkable. Well, first of all, they said there were over 200,000 people on the National Mall. Now, we know, of course, today you can't ever really tell how many people are on the National Mall. But they said 200,000, which is more people than I knew existed at the time. And there was preaching like I never heard at our later perpetual guilt on a Sunday morning. And then there was the music. Oh, man. Started off with Marian Anderson singing the National Anthem, followed by Mahalia Jackson. And for a little white kid from North Central Wisconsin to hear Mahalia Jackson for the first time, now that was a religious experience. And then out came what my mother told me were folk singers. I'd never heard of folk singers. I didn't know what a folk song was. And it's important to note that this was the day I discovered folk music, this thing that would sweep me up and enchant me and motivate me and mystify me for the rest of my life. And there was Odetta and there was Joan Baez and Bob Dylan and, and Peter, Paul and Mary and 
one of the things that I found most remarkable as as Peter, Paul, and Mary were singing the Pete Seeger, Lee Hayes song, If I Had a Hammer, the cameras were panning the crowd and everybody was singing. This was a revelation to me uh, because this was music that felt ancient and urgent at the same time it, it felt deep and and uh, weighty and it, it gave you wings at the same time and it was connected to a righteous cause and it spoke to that and it amplified that and it inspired people to participate And I thought about it and talked about it constantly. And then uh, the following school year, 1964, we had one of the very few assemblies we ever had. And I remember walking into the CAFA gymnatorium where uh, an hour earlier we had eaten lunch and an hour later we would have basketball practice. Suffice it to say, it was an aromatically confused environment and I plopped my little you know 10 year old or 12 year old butt down on that on one of those tired folding chairs and awaited the beginning of this assembly had no idea what was going to happen and out came this guy had no idea who he was god I'd love to know and he had a guitar and a banjo and he started to sing for us and I remember thinking oh my gosh there it is again. I thought I was the only one. I've gone back to that moment so frequently because I remember feeling, I want to do that. I want to learn how to do that. And on the crappiest nights of my professional life, when I've missed connections and my guitar didn't, or my banjo didn't show up and it was a terrible sound check and everything has gone wrong, before I go out on stage, I always remember there might be that kid out there. The result of the concert might be, I want to do that. And so I'm going to play for that kid. So that day in 1964, I began a two-year campaign. Not only me, my best friend and I began a relentless two-year campaign to convince our parents to buy us guitars. And when I turned 14, lo and behold, amazingly, they did. Now, in the summertime, this is August 1966, no one in Wisconsin at that point in time had air conditioning. I mean, if it got to be a really hot day, like 60 degrees, you just open your window. And that's what I did that August. And uh, let's just say I was an enthusiastic if undisciplined singer and I was so thrilled to have this guitar one night my sister came up and said John Mr. Stauner is here he wants to talk to you now back then if you were a kid say 14 years old and a neighboring adult came to your house and wanted to talk to you you knew you'd done something wrong and I was racking my brain to think of what it would be. And I came down and said, hello, sir, Mr. Stoner. He said, hello, John. I've been hearing you sing. And I thought, oh, that's it. I said, I'm really sorry. I just get carried away sometime. I promise I'll close the window. Sorry to bother you. He said, no, no, you're not bothering me. In fact, I want to hire you. And I remember thinking, man, I have been playing for two and a half weeks and I got a gig. This music business is easy. Well, Mr. Stoner, like every adult male I knew, except my dad, who was a traveling salesman, worked at one of the five paper mills that surrounded Wausau and Mosadee and Brokaw, Wisconsin. And Mr. Stoner, Jerry, was in charge of arranging the entertainment for the paper mill workers' unions Labor Day picnic, which was happening the following week. 
and uh, he heard uh, he had forgotten. He had he had been negligent in his duty. Let's say he heard me, got inspired, and figured, well, this will be easy and it'll be cheap. The less money we spend for entertainment, the more we can spend on beer, which is kind of a common uh, thought in the state of Wisconsin. And while I was flattered, I was also kind of nervous because I knew I wasn't very good. And I said, well, you know, I haven't been playing that long. I only know three songs. He says, well, that's fine. That's fine. Just sing those three songs over and over and over again. No one's going to be paying any attention to you anyway. And, uh, and I'll pay you $25. And I said, okay. I had never made $25 in a single day in my entire life up to that point. He said, but you got to sing this one song. And he told me the name of the song, and I said, I've, I don't know that song. He said, well, it's to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. You know that song, don't you? And I said, yeah. He said, great. Here are the words. It's to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. When I tell you, you sing this song, okay? And I'll see you on Monday. Well, I went down to our county library, which is the uh, fount of all knowledge to me in those days. And I found the chords for the Battle Hymn of the Republic. I looked at it and said, crap, it's got a B7. I was still struggling with an F. I showed up on that Labor Day out of Marathon County Park, adorned in my freshly ironed Kmart brand polyester white short sleeve shirt and my little clip-on tie. And I sang my three pathetic little songs off to the side over and over again. And sure enough, nobody was listening to me. No, they were all laughing and telling jokes and drinking beer and talking about, I don't know, probably the Packers. At the appointed time, Jerry gave me the high sign. I took out that little folded lyric sheet. I put it on the picnic table next to me, weighted it down with a can of Coke. And I started. <laughs> When the union's inspiration through the workers but Chevron, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. And then something really remarkable happened. Everybody stopped and they turned to me. And each of these men stood up and they grabbed the paw of the nearest guy and they raised their hands over their heads. It was one of the least manly but most masculine things I've ever seen. And they started to sing. And I knew these guys. I'd sat next to them in church. They didn't sing, not even in church. But they did this day. Solidarity forever. this what did this song do to these people I got to find out what this is about and I've spent the next 50 plus years trying to figure out what it's about a few years later I attended my very first concert it was a Pete Seeger concert and as many of you who went through that same experience know it was a life-changing experience to be surrounded by all kinds of people who had been told our whole lives we could not sing. Who discovered we could? People who thought we had no power found out we did. People who thought we were all alone discovered we weren't. I mean, a concert as a community building exercise? I mean, it was unheard of. It was unimaginable. It was, it was unforgettable. And I left the hall that night thinking, I want to do that again. No, no, I, I have to do that again. It was the same year I went off to college. I went to a little college in northern Minnesota, St. John's University. And um, 
that's where I started to play the banjo, which was a lonely activity in northern Minnesota in 1970. So they kept me on a really long leash there at St. John's, and they agreed in 1972 to let me take a three-month independent study to hitchhike around the southern Appalachians digging up banjo players. And I did. And I came face-to-face -face with a community that matched the kind of skewed notions about music and art that I had somehow developed over the years through all those experiences of seeing things that, ways in which music brought people together. None of these life-changing experiences were about uh, a spectacle, nor were they about someone showing off on stage and, and a large group of people applauding someone's skill. No, it was about creating a community. It was about participation. And I went south thinking that I was on a mission to learn how to play a musical instrument, to put my fingers in the right place at the right time. But what I encountered were communities in which art and culture was instrumental rather than merely ornament, ornamental to community life, how it was a function and not merely a byproduct of community. Artists had responsibility. So many times I would be playing with some old codger who was younger than I am now, but he seemed like an old guy back then. And he said, oh, we got to stop now because I got to go down and play in church. Or we're having a pie supper to raise money for a clinic and uh, I volunteered to play. Or I got to play for the square dance or I got to play on the picket line. This was art getting its hands dirty. I had somehow grown up with the notion in this culture in which artists are either the elite or the insignificant that musicians and dancers and writers had we're, we're, we're no more and certainly no less important than the people who taught our children or put out the fires or delivered the mail or raised our crops. That this was a place where I saw music help create and sustain communities in profound ways. So I decided to hang out and explore a little more and that was almost 50 years ago. I'm still on that three month independence uh, study. It's a big subject. And that's when I realized I had to make some money somehow. And what I really wanted to do was play music. So I started getting the odd gig here and there. And eventually, the folk music community and I found one another. And I came from it, at it from a, a really different place. And that's part of what I want to talk about. I did a deep dive and continue to do a deep dive into traditional music in all its many forms, but mostly because it is so foundational to community. I not only learned how to play musical instruments in traditional communities and how to sing in traditional communities, the traditional music taught me how to write, how to how to, you know, when I started off, I was singing some traditional song and then I'd sing one of my puny little songs. And the first song had been worn smooth and beautiful on a thousand tongues before mine. And then came this willowy little offering. And I had to stop and think, okay, let's look at these songs, which were created by community. And what is there to learn? But also, what is there to learn about taking this sensibility? In traditional cultures, it's all about repetition. And in contemporary culture, the watchword seems to be innovation and the next big thing. And in our folk music community, 
we have this same kind of tension going on. I do not believe they are mutually exclusive. And in fact, I would posit that it is essential that they learn from one another. Because obviously we are in situations as an entertainer, and I understand that's what I'm being hired to do, where we want to give an audience what they want, but we also, and I've seen this from my tutelage in traditional communities, give them what they need. And we can't be so presumptuous to think that we know what that is. We have to pay attention. We have to do our homework. We have to find out where we are. Why are these people here with me tonight? What's my job here? What's my responsibility? How can I replicate what so moved me back then? Not only in that school when I was a, a, a 12 year old kid, but also when I went to that first concert of Pete's. When I go to so many concerts where I'm truly moved, where I come out a different person, hopefully a better person. When I first started off, I was the beneficiary of, uh, of something that was created, I have always theorized, by Joe McCarthy. It's true, another Midwesterner, unfortunately. Because when Pete was blacklisted back in the 1940s and 50s by the House on american Activities Committee, he went from being the keystone of probably the biggest folk music group ever to being essentially unemployable. So Toshi, his wife, got on the phone and started calling up little folk song societies that sprung up around the country and at colleges and progressive churches and unions and, and the odd college here and there. And Pete set off across this country playing for audiences large and small and the result of that makeshift journey was the folk music circuit. And I and many of you here today are the beneficiaries of that. So when I went out, I was following that same path as were so many other artists. And what I found was these groups were largely not created to be concert presenters. No, they were people that just wanted to provide a place where people could get together and learn how to play and to have song swaps and just have that kind of community that this music seemed to provide. And oh yeah, and if there's somebody happened to be coming through who might help out our, our community or our group, sure, we'll put on a show for them. But participation, not presentation, was their primary focus. And I would charge that the balance has shifted untenably and would encourage y'all who are in your own folk music groups to understand that the participation model is more sustainable. If only half as many people as you expected showed up at a concert, that can create financial havoc for your organization, it can sink it perhaps. But if only half as many people show up at the song swap, well, it just makes it more intimate. So I went out there and I, I, and I, I played for your groups and I did workshops and I <coughs> played in the schools that you set up and I slept on your couches and I became an expert in potluck suppers and was the beneficiary of all this and came away with some clear notions of what this community could do and what it might do. And I want to use the rest of this time uh, to talk about the ways in which we use what we have, what we know, what we value, what we know is powerful in this world today because it needs it more than we ever have. The first story I want to tell you is about my friend Vedran Smilovich. Vedran was the principal cellist for the Sarajevo Opera Orchestra. And in May of 1992, at the height of the Balkan War, there was a mortar attack on the last operating bakery in the city of Sarajevo, and 22 people standing in a bread line were killed. 
the bakery sat on Vasaminska, which is a square in old Sarajevo. And opposite the bakery was the hall in which the opera orchestra uh, rehearsed. The following day, precisely at the hour of the attack, Smilovich showed up in a tuxedo and strode across the square, set up his chair in front of that bakery, sat down, and played Abanoni, Abanino's Abanoni's Adagio in G minor. One of the few pieces of music salvaged after the firebombing of Dresden. And when he was done playing that piece of music, he simply got up and left. Only to show up the following day, precisely at the hour of the attack, to play the same piece of music again. And he showed up the next day, and the day after that, for 22 straight days he played, one day for each of those people lost, one adagio for each of those families. There is a quote by Leonard Bernstein that hangs over my desk. I'm, I'm seeing it now. This will be our reply to violence to make music more passionately, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before. The other story I want to tell you is about another Midwesterner, this time from South Dakota. Sue Ann Big Crow was the most storied athlete ever to emerge from the Pine Ridge Reservation. Now, if Pine Ridge sounds familiar to you, it's because that's where Wounded Knee happened twice. Now, Sue Ann was a standout in every sport, but her dream was to lead her high school basketball team, the Lady Thorpes, to the South Dakota State Championship, thereby making it the very first native team to ever win a state championship in any sport in any state. Well, in her senior year, she scored the winning basket as time ran out in the championship game. Most people would consider that the zenith of their athletic careers. But I maintain her finest moment on the basketball court happened three years earlier when she was a freshman. I am Sue and Big Crow. I am 14 years old here on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I play for the Lady Thorpes, but that night on the court I was the Ogallala Nation. I was prepared for this moment before I was born by Chief Big Crow, Sans Ark Lakota. I am of his line, but the moment was mine the night we played in Leeds, South Dakota. I was the first one through the door, the first one on the floor. The lead fans exploded like a bomb. The fake Indian war whoops, the curses, the shouts and hoots. I felt my racing heart grow still and calm. The ball fell from my hands as I faced the seething stands. My warm-up jacket draped across my shoulder. I danced the shawl dance, I sang the sacred chants, and in their silence I felt ages older. And I danced, isn't this beautiful? Is this real? We have danced this for these countless years. Before you left Europe, before wounded knee, before the long trail of tears. This land is an ideal, but nothing here is real till someone ventures an act. For all and for free until we finally see if freedom is fiction or fact. I am Sue and B. Crow, I am 14 years old, here on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I play for the Lady Thorpes, but 
That night on the court, I was the old of the nation. I play for the Lady Thorps, but that night on the court, I was the old of the nation. So what is the connection between these two stories, Vedran Smilovich and Sue Ann Vigcrow? They both chose to respond to ugliness with beauty, but not only with, with beauty, but with, with, with a cultural tool, with music, with song, with dance. In Sue Ann's case especially, as she faced, as a 14-year-old, just Take a moment and imagine the clarity, the self-knowledge, the connection to your community that you have to feel at 14 to stand there and face this crowd and their racist responses to, to Sue Ann and her teammates and say, oh, so you think this is who I am? Okay, let me show you what I am. Let me show you who we are. And not only that, I'm going to show you something beautiful, something sacred, something you will not see elsewhere. And this is going to be my gift to you. Smilovich told me that as he was playing in front of that bakery all those days, Soldiers came up to him and said, why are you playing where we are bombing? And his response is, why are you bombing where I am playing? This is who I am. This is who I am a part of. And that's what I want to talk about in closing. Who are we? Who are we a part of? This gathering even virtually, that is, at its best, a, a, a family gathering, a trade show, a, a, a desperate audition. But this place where we can come, where we don't have to explain ourselves, maybe the only time we are around a large group of other people who are obsessed with the same thing we are. And we can go away knowing or maybe we're not crazy, but we're certainly not alone. But who are we? What are we a part of? How do we do that? How do we, how do we determine? How do we announce? How do we celebrate who we are? We celebrate that by whom we honor. With the Lamplighter Award, with your own Lifetime Achievement Award for folk music in the Midwest, these people, these recipients, who have gotten this, who will receive this this year. These were people who were contributors, not stars. The criterion was not who had the biggest crowds, who made the most money, who sold the most CDs, who had the, the most awards. No, this was for dedication and for service to the community. That's who we are. We are, we are creating our own genealogy we are naming our ancestors so that the people who come from who come after us can look back and say oh okay this is who this organization was this this is this is this was in fact their mission statement this list of people that we honor i mean think of the ones that we have lost just recently i mean we've lost Pete, we've lost Odetta, we've lost John Lewis, Michael Smith. All these people are remembered and revered not just for their skill, not for doing their jobs well, but for seeing it as something greater. We honor them for their courage, for their ability, their willingness to take a stand when everyone else sat, to speak out, 
when everyone else was silent, to sing when no one else would, to remember the, the unnamed and the unknown and the forgotten and the dispossessed, to sanctify those lives in the songs that we write and that we choose to sing. The stories we tell are about our community. And that is what we carry forward. And it's worth the repetition. It is part of establishing a culture. Not what's the next shiny new thing, but what is sacred among us. When all of this started, and I by this I mean this coronavirus stuff, when it all started, I was on tour in Australia. And I came home and um, immediately went into uh, quarantine. And I brought a pile of books with me and my dog. And I did a lot of writing and uh, I continue to do a lot of writing. Um, but one of the books I reread um, was by Bruce Chatwin. It's called Songlines. And it's a, a, a book about Australia. And I was reminded it by my friend Ted Egan, who uh, is, uh, if there is a dean of Australian music, Ted is that. He's 87 years old, uh, speaks 11 different Aboriginal languages, and reminded me of the song lines. That, uh, and this is, um, as young First Australians, sometimes called Aboriginals, as, as First Australians uh, uh, grow, they learn the old songs from the elders. And these aren't just not random songs. No, these are songs that are attached to places. And as they walk about, when they enter a new territory, they have to know the song that is connected with that piece of land. And they call it, as they traverse the continent, singing their world into being. And it's a beautiful concept. And as a close, I want to challenge each of you to think about, as I have described today, what was it that brought you here? What was it that captured you that very first time? Was it sitting on that couch next to your mother in 1963? Was it sitting on that folding chair in that stinky old gymnatorium? Was it attending that concert? Was there a particular song? Was it the way you saw music work in the world that made you say, ah, ah, this is my way of singing the world into being? I mean it both figuratively, internally, and literally. We are needed in this world today. And I don't just mean people who sing what could broadly be called political songs. No, our world needs good Cajun bands. They need good polka bands, you good accordion playing Midwesterners. It needs songs that we can sing to our children to put them to sleep at night. It needs stories that teach us the timeless lessons. It needs music and dances that will allow us to hold one another in our arms no matter how much we might disagree with one another. It's what breaks us down into human beings. It's what helps us create a community rather than merely a marketplace. And it's something that will make us proud to be called ancestors. So I want to finish with one last song. And thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your conference and your world. years from now, my great-great-grandchildren's time will bear any resemblance to this world of mine, this place of boundless beauty, wonders bright and bold I can't possibly imagine for the time ahead my own. Each 
day I am more of the past. The future is not mine, and I know that what is left me now is for the next in line. Have we packed well for the journey? As we, have we done all that we could more in trying to be great again, forgotten to be I saw the handprint on the cave wall Reaching from the past I wondered just what kind of ancestor I might be at last One hundred years from now, my great-great-grandchildren's day. I hope they find the breadcrumbs I've left along the way. Just over the horizon, a place I cannot go. This message in a bottle of a century ago. Thank you. Dang, I can start my video. Thank you, John McCutcheon. Oh, you're welcome. It was. Um, I even put. I even put on the same shirt, so it looked like I just did that. <laughs> gonna say we could have done something kind of clever and not told anybody it was a video but i'm not uh, well i think the page turns would have uh oh yeah i might have given it away <laughs> given that away how does it do that oh, it's fancy um we're so grateful to you for that i know how much work you put into it and it was everything and more that you know if only we were in person and we could be standing up in front of you in a great big auditorium I think that I hope you can picture that because that is exactly what would be happening. Well, I just wish we were together. Amen. We do have a few questions. And since you have kindly agreed to stick around and, and address some curiosities here, I'm going to um, I'm going to start with what I think might be. I don't know. None of these are going to be quick answers. So we're going to start with Michael Stock, who has asked has Carmen Agra Didi changed your career path at all? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I'm assuming. A bit of, a bit of explanation is, uh, Carmen Agra Didi is my wife. Oh. <laughs> like and she is a renowned uh, children's book author and she is also the best storyteller I know. In fact, we met, um, what, um, 20 years ago um, at the National Storytelling Festival in, in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Um, well, certainly since Carmen and I have been together and been married, uh, it's really a treat to share a house with someone that kind of gets what you do. And we are constantly showing one another things that we're working on. Um, and that is a totally, I've never had a relationship with anybody, uh, that I could do that with before. And, um, uh, because we're kind of, the, uh, she's Cuban, uh, because we're kind of the Lucy and Desi with the gender reversed of, of the storytelling world, we get, I get in, I have subsequently gotten invited to a lot of uh, storytelling festivals, mostly because of her, and have really had the opportunity to be around a lot of people who use words in a thoughtful and uh, precise and powerful way and more than anything, it's helped me think about how to use um, story, not only within songs, but to tie songs together and to kind of amplify and expand what people can think about when they're hearing the song that has been set up by this story, which is, which is never, I wrote this song because. Um, so 
that and, and many other ways she's uh, but uh, she's she's a remarkable artist and I would encourage any of you all to check out her her children's books and uh, and her storytelling for sure okay well that's good to know um, Mark Smith wants to know what is Appleseed doing these days and, <laughs> and, and I feel like that's Appleseed is like <laughs> a, well Appleseed is my production company I started back in the 1970s uh, when I was living in um, Southwest Virginia, I, I was doing a lot of field recording and I worked together with a, a company called June Apple Records, which was a part of a media collective in East Kentucky called Apple Shop. And there, so I started their, their uh, field recording division, which was called Appleseed. And after I broke off, I just kept the name. Uh, so it's, it's really kind of the umbrella for all the different things that I do, whether it be writing or performing or teaching or um, uh, more recently I, I've been doing some one-man plays um, but what is Appleseed doing these days it's right it's now, it's but, you know. desperate it's on life support just like y'all are uh, and trying to trying to create new ways to uh, uh, to connect with audiences and you know we got we keep doing this work in fact I've got I've written more than I've ever written I've got you know, an album sitting on the shelf that I was going to do when I came back from Australia, and I've got 40 new songs since Cabin Fever, and so I'm, I just invite people in to say, so what do we do now? And it's something that, you know, this is what I'm going to do, it will also, what are you going to do? So it's kind of collaborating with other artists and stuff, so Appleseed's just chugging along. Yeah, I'm going to interject a question of my own here, because I am kind of um, amazed by how much you're writing, and like I mean, you're, you're not the only one who's put out a record, but I want to say you were one of the first to put a, a record out from, you know, that was completely composed in quarantine. And now, and I've also talked with other songwriters who are, are not feeling inspired at all to write. And so what is it? Where's your space? You've just, is it the quarantine? Um, it reminds me a little bit about post 9-11. Uh, because we had a lot of people who were in this sort of say, I, I'm immobilized and I don't know what to do, or I'm writing more than I've ever written. And I have, um, sort of my whole creative life, have always wanted to explore something when um, it's big and life-changing. Uh, when my first granddaughter was born, I decided to start writing that day and just see what happened. And part of it is just being curious about what's going to come out. Um, I, when I write these days, and I write every day, um, I don't write down, sit down and say, I'm going to write a song about this. But rather, I always do some meditation beforehand, which I think, especially in these times, is, is really critical and important and useful. Um, and then when the deck is clear, it's just sort of like what, you know, oh, here's some birds feeding on the bird feeder. What does that inspire? Or there's gravel crackling on the road. Oh, well that, you know, okay, I'm gonna gravel crackle down the road and see where the story goes. Um, the more I write, the more I know I don't really know where it comes from and I'm just fascinated by exploring those things. And I'm not, I'm not a woo-woo guy, y'all know that. Uh, but I know that there's a lot we don't know and um, you write crap because you do um, Annie Lamott talks about the shitty first draft which is a cause for celebration not disappointment because you've got something down and you're you're ready to start working on it so I I just find that whenever something is going on um, I'll say, okay, I want to write about this because I don't really know what I think. And this helps me. Yeah. So, um, bird by bird. Yeah. Yeah. You brought her up. Yep. Good. It's nice to know. My friend Jan Chris turned me onto that book. It's, it's, awesome. it's one of the best books about writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree. Okay. So, let's go to Wanda Fisher's question, which is a two parter. How can music be an instrument of change during these challenging times? And can the old protest songs be as effective as songs written contemporaneously? Big words, Wanda, specifically to address today's issues. 
okay, there, there's two parts to this. Um, I think many of us came into this music because of what it, of its ability to, I feel like I'm, you know, getting a nickel every time I say this, its ability to create community. Those, those times when people find a home in a song that is not necessarily the same home you found, but just opening up the possibility of inviting people in in the course of a song is, is righteous work. It's frontline work um, to, for our hearts and for our souls and for this country. The old, I mean, this is all about what I just talked about. I mean, the old songs live together with the new songs. I just did a, a, a workshop at an at Atlanta school with a choir where I told them the story of how we shall overcome gestated uh, at the Highlander Center in, starting in 1947 in East Tennessee where a group of African-American tobacco workers who were on strike, all women, came and they brought this song that they had reworked an old hymn and of course as you all know most of the songs from the civil rights movement were old hymns that were just repurposed by changing the singular pronoun to the plural so they came in saying you know this old hymn i'll be all right someday will be all right someday in the course of this workshop it became you know we will overcome and then septima clark who was the uh, education director there told me back in 1975 Five. I was eating lunch with her. She said, you know, John, I'm the person that changed it to shall. And I said, really? What caused that change? She said, well, people open their mouths when they say shall. It's better than will. And I wrote that in my little songwriter's handbook. But the story of uh, uh, Janelle Jones, who was the young woman who lives in Atlanta today, I said, this is who you should get to your school, not me. You should get Janelle Jones, who was the young girl at the Highlander Center when the police raided sitting under the desk and everybody started singing, We Shall Overcome. The police said, stop that singing. And she wrote the most important verse, which is, We Are Not Afraid. She wrote that verse as a 17-year-old frightened kid because what music is able to do for us, is able, we're able to talk about ourselves in ways that we can't talk about ourselves. We are not afraid. Of course we're afraid. But the greatest power wielded over us is not guns and, and police batons, it is fear. And when you are able to stand up to that, um, then you've disarmed your, your opponent. And music can do that in ways that nothing else can do. It's a weapon that the man does not understand. To paraphrase Martin, he used to say, if you fight the man with the man's weapons, he will kill you because they're his weapons. So you've got to fight the man with weapons that the man does not understand. And we are not afraid. I hope that answers your question in some way. Wanda. And, and, and there's, you know, there's, there's a place to be broad about that, which is what the traditional songs do. We shall not be moved. I ain't scared of your jail because I want my freedom. You know, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. We shall overcome. Yes, but you can also sing about kids at the border. You can also sing about, you know, Breonna Taylor. You can sing about, and you can name names, and that's one of the things that music can do in ways that, uh, again, are, take, I mean, name three speeches from the Civil Rights Movement. You probably can't. Now, name the songs you can remember. They, they were portable. You took them with you. Yeah, it's true. I was gonna say, speaking of weapons, you're surrounded by quite a few in that room, sir. <laughs> Yeah, this is an old, uh, you know, I, my entire adult career, I never had a house with a basement or a garage. And Carmen and I bought this place a few years ago so her parents could move with, in with us. And um, it had two garages, one for cars and one for John. <laughs> it's the first time in my life 
I've ever had all my junk everywhere because if, if they're hiding away in, in uh, cases, they get forgotten. But if, if my old, you know, Weisenborn guitar on the, on, hanging behind me here sees me walk in the door one day, it says, play me. And, uh, and all of a sudden I've lost the morning. I think that it, there is exactly why the instruments should be out and on the wall, and they're beautiful. I'd have you go around if we had time and play each one of them. Um, but anyone ah. who's ever seen you perform in concert knows that you pretty much get a taste of all of that, which is amazing and awesome. Um, I'm going to, we have two, just a few minutes left before we have to let you go, which is hard. But Cabin Fever, Michael Stock is saying you, you released Cabin Fever digitally only. Is that right? Yeah, I had no money, and well, yeah. um, the only place you really, you performers out there know this, mm -hmm. uh, almost the only place you're really selling CDs anymore is to the wonderful neo-Luddites that show up at your shows. So I knew there weren't going to be any shows for a while, I didn't have any money to pay for it, and I thought, um, well, I'll just put it up, you know, we're all thinking about new ways to do this. Um, and. Uh, so I just decided I was going to do a digital download only. And even more interesting, and this is something I want to share with you other recording people out there, is because I knew a lot of people didn't have any money to buy even downloads, that, um, but I, they need music too, and maybe even more than some other people, that I made it to pay what you can and my stepdaughter Erin who works in my office after about a month of it being out said you need to do all your albums like this because <laughs> lots of people are paying way more than 10 or 15 dollars that they would have paid but that's a, a hallmark of the community that wants to say hey we want to support you because we know you're not working and I'm I know a lot of you musicians have felt that out there but I think Michael's question is am I ever going to go back to physical stuff yeah yeah you I mean, <laughs> it's what I, it's what you do. I mean, I remember after doing the Pete Seeger album, my engineer looked at me and said, do you think we're ever going to do another one of these? Um, and, you know, after working hard in the studio is really what you want your incarnation out there to be an MP3, this squashed little piece of crap. I mean, even with uh, Cabin Fever, again, for you people who sell CDs, uh, I have the opportunity to download it as an MP3, which is faster, takes up less room on your phone, or as a WAV file so that you can either burn your own CD or listen to it the way it was intended. So, uh, Michael, you'll still be getting hard copies from me in some way, <laughs> shape, or form down there at, at your radio station in Miami. Nice. All right, well, John, we're going to finish this up with the announcement that I would be, I'm looking at Stephanie right now, and I know she would kill me if I didn't bring up this very exciting event that we have coming up, because we're not, obviously, farm is not entirely done with you, but um, this goes way beyond farm, but you have agreed graciously to do um, a oh, concert yeah. that is kind of a, a collaborative with farm and also fundraiser. Um, for us and for your alma mater, and um, you want to just tell us a, a little bit about that? And yeah, um, I, I'm. Thank you for bringing this up. I would have totally forgotten, and my agent Mike Green, who's actually on this call, <laughs> would have been sending me obscene things in the chat. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things that we've come up with is the notion of getting a group of traditional presenters together and having them as a group co-sponsor an online concert and sell tickets for this and have them sell tickets first. So if the Ark and the 10 Pound Fiddle and the Old Town School of Folk Music and Mad Folk and the Cedar Cultural Center all said, okay, we wanna do this concert of, of uh, you know, uh, Robert Jones. And we're each gonna sell our own tickets and uh, they get they get a cut because musicians as you all know have an opportunity in these online things to make some money but our presenters especially the brick and mortar places are dying and we want the workplace to be
be there on the other side of this. Otherwise, there's going to be no work. So uh, my, alma, my alma mater, St. John, whose fault it is I'm doing all this because they gave me this, you know, three-month independent study that I'm still on 48 years later, um, wanted me to do something with them. And uh, Mike had the brilliant idea of bringing Farm in as a co-presenter so that uh, the money is going to be divvied up between me and St. John's and Farm. So and it'll be on the Friday evening of Thanksgiving Day weekend when y'all aren't doing anything. Y'all just, you have, all the football happens on Thursday and Saturday. Um, so um, it's when I used to traditionally do a, a concert in Atlanta for the Atlanta Food Bank, um, it's for St. John's and Farm this year. So check it out. Come, uh, have, come home for the holidays. There you go. We're going to be we're going to be blasting John's face over our email newsletters in the coming month again, and we're very pleased every time. Sorry. We <laughs> no, it's wonderful. I all right, all you the ones of you who are able to unmute yourselves, which is our panelists, our board today, who I know are all really grateful to you as I am for your time, your energy, your effort, your inspiring words. Um, we're going to be posting this up on our website, and you can people can watch it over and over and over again. Which, I'm sure they'll want to. Thank you, Joe Gale, for your captioning. Um, and uh, everybody, let's just unmute ourselves so we can hear real applause. <laughs> so, Thank you all for all the work you do. You have the Thank hard you. work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.